Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well. This, I've got like 15 windows open, so I want to make sure I share the right screen for these slides. Can you see the one that says introduction to the Turing way? That is the correct Cool. One. I have shared the right one, not this like endless like spreadsheet that I can leave that open. Cool. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, as I already mentioned, my name is Hari. Um, I'm from the, uh, I work at the Turing Institute, but also part of the Turing Way community. Um, and we'll be talking through you guys' an introduction to the Turing Way. And just to say, I have not just put these resources together myself, but Sophia has helped and also Anna Esther have put this stuff together as well. So thank you to Sophia and the others as well for these resources. So very brief introduction on me. As I already mentioned, my name is Hari. Like when you go somewhere quickly, you're in a hurry. Sorry, Sophia and Rini, you've heard that countless times over the last few weeks and months. I am a research application manager at the Turing Institute. And so my role is to help the Turing find sort of real world impact and usage implementation for their research outputs. So to make sure that the research we're doing isn't just papers and looks good, but it's actually being having national and potentially international impact as well. And as I already mentioned, I'm working on Turing's trusted research environment infrastructure. And I'm not sure how much you guys know about it. I think you'll be working with it. Um, as I really mentioned in your day-to-day -day work, we're trying to find a way to make that open source and collaborative and as easy to use across different institutions as possible. If you do have questions about it, please do please do hit me up or, or ask at the end of the session, or I'm always contactable as well. And I'll make my address, which you can share later as well. And on top of that, I'm a core contributor to the Turing Way community. So as part of my role at the Turing Institute, um, I'm involved in the Turing Way community and creating content, but also working with the community to collaborate on what the resource looks like, which we'll get into in a minute. So to give you guys a very brief background, I'm sure you know this already, but from the, about the Turing Institute itself. So the Turing Way is hosted at the Turing Institute. It's really important to say it's hosted there and not just limited to the Turing Institute. So it is a project that has no boundaries anywhere on earth, but it's sort of fundamentally hosted at the Turing Institute. And we were established in 2015 as the National Institute for Data Science and AI with three main aims and goals. The first being to advance world-class, oh, advance, advance world-class research and crucially apply it to real world problems. So not just do cool research that looks cool in the journal, but make sure we're applying it to real world problems and seeing like real impact from those from that research. And training the leaders of the future, both in data science and AI, but also leading the public conversation. So we're not a private company. We're not driven by commercial incentives. We're driven by what can we do for the public good and how can we lead that conversation to make sure we're working on the right kind of thing. And just as like a front load for you guys, I know you've been talking a lot recently with Irene and Sophia about the importance of GitHub and how it can be useful for running projects collaboratively um, and with a community. And what will potentially come clear as we go through the, the presentation today is that GitHub forms a really fundamental part of the work we do in the Turing way. It's important to say that it's not like the must go to tool, the only one that exists for working with communities, but for us, it, it really helps um, facilitate the kind, of, the kind of work and kind of stuff we're trying to do. And um, just to front load that, and you'll see as we go how important it, it, a role it performs. So yeah, to give you uh, the overview of what the Turing Way is, so you can think of it as an open source guide for data science um, and an involving and supporting a diverse community to make data science reproducible, ethical, collaborative, and inclusive for anyone and everyone anywhere. Um, and so it kind of splits into a few different things for us. Um, I think first and foremost, there is the idea of it being a GURP book. So it's an online free to access guide with loads of different information and resources and loads of useful things within the data science space. But much more than that, um, it's a global community of researchers or experts or even just people interested and curious about data science who are collaboratively working together um, to create the content for the guide. It's also an open source project and we'll get into exactly what that means in a second. Um, but it basically means that anyone anywhere can contribute to it and not only write content, but also update and maintain resources, share ideas, thoughts, questions about where the book should go um, and all their best practices around data science as well. Um, and sort of linked into all of this on a very sort of wide macro level, um, really focus on this culture of collaborations, trying to break down silos of individual work, trying to make sure we're not duplicating work, but sort of moving towards sharing ideas and work and practices with the community and collaborating on pushing data science forward in these ways of reproducibility and being ethical and collaborative and inclusive. Cool. So yeah, just mentioned what open source is um, and just to clarify what a couple of, uh, what that means in case you guys haven't come across it before. So open source has its roots in the free software movement of around-ish the mid to late eighties. And effectively at that stage, software was all 
private and commercially owned, and so you'd have to have a private license to use it. So you had to pay for the license and you'd be able to use the software. And at, around that time, people thought it'd be better for there to be a bit more freedom and autonomy around the software that existed. And so initially started by changing the licenses um, on the software to allow people to modify um, different programs for their own use, um, but also derive their own work from it as well. And so start, start to have a bit more of their own um, interpretation and usage for software that existed. And this coalesced over the years into what was known as the free and open, so open source software movement, which isn't just about modifying pre-existing software or deriving pre-existing software from pre-existing software, but also building that software from the ground up. So building um, different um, programs from the ground up in an open place where anyone can get involved, anyone can contribute as well. And then in the wider sort of open source movement and different open movements, um, there are things like open knowledge, open data, open access, open science, which are all sort of built on this principle of being done out in the open and anyone anywhere can get involved and shape how those resources are made. And we see the Turing Way kind of fitting into the open knowledge and open science part of, of those open movements. And on the right there, you can just see a, a bunch of different um, initiatives and organizations have been really involved in this open space over the years, like the Free Software Foundation, Open Source Initiative, Open Knowledge Foundation, Open Access. There's loads more as well. I really recommend if you guys are interested to look up these, these organizations and more out there to see what kind of work they're doing. In terms of what the Turing Way actually looks like on the inside, so as I mentioned, it's like an online book. It's a book that's online, like a resource um, containing a bunch of different guides on reproducible data science. They're kind of split into these six main guides. So it started as a guide on reproducibility. And for us, that means if you're doing research, using the same data and the same methods to get the same outputs wherever you're doing that research. And reproducibility is really important for the robustness of research. So it means that if you're, if I'm doing some research, I can sort of hand it off to one of you guys who's doing the research in an entirely different institution. And if you use the same methods and the same data, you can get the same results and then confirm, okay, that's good research. Are those the right results or that's accurate? Um, and it just makes the research being done more robust and, and more easy to corroborate and confirm. Um, but what we realize is that in order to make research transparent and open, and accessible to everybody. It's not just about reproducibility. There's a lot more um, that needs to be considered. And so these guides kind of morphed out of that. And we will go into these in a bit more detail as to what they exactly contain in a minute, but just to give you guys a rough overview. So the next four guides kind of emerge out of that. So things thinking about things like project design, how you can how can you design not only your research projects, but any projects to be as open and accessible as possible. Things like communication. Do you have the right communication channels and methods set up so that not only your team internally can work together well and effectively, but also you're communicating with any external stakeholders or users of your um, services or things that you're building um, to keep them up to date with the work that you're doing and the progress you're making. There's real focus on collaboration. So how can you pull together resources and expertise and practices towards common goals? Can you find out what those common goals are? Can you share them? Can you find the right people who are involved in those kind of things and really make sure that you're not duplicating work, but working together to achieve those common goals and potentially bigger and wider goals than you could do yourself. And also thinking about things like ethical research. So are, if you're working with personal data or sensitive data, um, are you doing it in an ethical way? Are you following the law? Really important one, but also just like best practice um, ethically and morally in, in handling these projects. Are you doing research for the right reasons? All those kind of questions as well. And, and, and again, people to think about those. And then what came out of those five chapters um, was a, a really cool community of people who were practicing this stuff in really like amazing ways. And we realized here's a really good chance actually to share those practices in with the rest of the community so they can use them themselves. And so a sixth guide on a community handbook, which is basically just a collection of resources to help practice all these ideas within reproducible and open data science that anyone can use in their own day-to-day -day work as well. So I'll just dive into a bit more detail on what some of these guides include. The most important thing to say here is this is not either a comprehensive list of everything they include, nor is it a priority list of these are the most important ones. It's just a handful of the kind of things you guys can find in there. I do recommend um, if you're interested to go explore these guides in more detail and I'll say more than I ever could in this 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, in the reproducible research guide, you can find um, um, thoughts and content on things like open research. So how can you make sure you have open access, open data, open source software, open scholarship and the research you're doing, how you manage that and how you can do it effectively, all that kind of stuff. Talks about things like version control. So a comprehensive guide on how to use Git, um, which sort of forms the version control and, and collaborative abilities um, that underlie GitHub as well. So I do recommend if you're a bit rusty on things like 
merging and and forking and pull requests and all that kind of stuff um, i recommend and branching all that kind of thing um there is a very useful guide here in the just research section thinking about things like research data management how are you storing data in your research projects how are you describing it how are you allowing it to be reused how are you maintaining it and um, all that kind of stuff and also some things about like reproducible environments so not only thinking about your data and your methods being reproducible but how can you set up the entirety of all the research you're doing to be reproducible so that someone can take the entire thing and do it elsewhere and get the same result as you. On the project design side, again, loads more than just what's on this page, but to, to pick a couple, um, think about things like planning your planning for project design documentation. So how can you set up any projects you're working on? Again, it doesn't have to be research projects. It can be any projects you're working on um, to be, how can you do so effectively and make sure you're designing it to be accessible, open, flexible to the needs of people you're working with, but also well-documented and well-maintained so that anybody coming into it can pick up from exactly where you are and not have to spend ages trying to figure out what's going on and who's doing what and how things work. Think about things like creating project repositories. So on GitHub, you can create repositories um, and specifically designing these projects to be, and repositories to be ready for collaboration and communication with the wider community and what kind of different aspects that you can set up from the beginning to set you up to do that well. I also think about things like personas and pathways. So who can contribute to projects? Um, who do you want to contribute to projects? Is it other researchers? Um, if you're not working on a research project, is it users? Is it external stakeholders? I know you guys are working a lot with different NHS trusts. So who from those different trusts would you want to contribute to the project? But also how can they contribute? Do these people have, do they all have technical expertise or does some not have technical expertise? Are they all subject matter experts or are they just curious and want to find out more? And how are you, setting that up for them to get involved and meet them where they are and get involved in a way that is easy for them to get involved. And yeah, on terms of like what do they already know? So thinking about things like jargon or terms or concepts that are hard to understand. If people aren't familiar with those, how can we simplify them to allow anyone who wants to get involved to get involved? In terms of communication, again, loads of different resources. Some highlights um, include the, especially talking about specific tangible methods you can use for communication. So blog posts, podcasts, posters, talks, social media, how can you leverage these different um, communication mediums to, to talk about your projects, um, but also communicating the outputs. So your research outputs, it's all well and good to communicate about them, but if people want to find out more, can they find out where they are? Have you published them somewhere? Are they easily citable so people can make reference to them? Uh, people who then do um, additional work on top have the route back to where the, the original research came from. Um, and sort of on a wider level and a more of the human level is within your projects, how have you set them up to allow interactions to take place? That could be, again, within your own teams, but with external stakeholders or other projects around the country or internationally that are working on similar things. How do you, how those interactions take place and, and what kind of principles and things can you think about to make sure that those interactions can take place effectively? On the collaboration side, again, there's a lot on GitHub. So things about, um, reviewing contributions, merging contributions, best practice around managing all that kind of stuff, um, really helpful resources on that. Thinking about managing um, a community, a team, a network or more um, is definitely important for, the, for uh, different groups of people to, to be productive and work towards the goals they're trying to achieve, but not forgetting about openness and collaborative, the collaborative nature of the work that you're doing and transparency and all that kind of stuff. And how can you have both and not forget about one or the other? And thinking about things like remote collaboration. So if you are working people in different places, you're doing so on different time zones, different languages, all that kind of stuff. How can you allow people to do that effectively so you can work with anyone, anywhere who wants to get involved with the project? And on the ethical research side, there's a bunch of really interesting stuff here. Um, think about things like ethics committees, what are workflows and decisions that need to be made in order to follow ethical best practice or potentially even the law, and especially within the healthcare sector and you're handling people's personal data and personal health data, uh, what do you need to be doing, um, either need to be doing, but also should be doing from an ethical and moral perspective um, in handling research products around this stuff. Thinking about what the law is, but also what policies and what human rights um, people have. <laughs> so thinking about what, what important considerations apply to our work. And crucially, again, it's not just what do I need to do from a minimum sufficiency level, but really thinking about what should I be doing or ought to be doing um, just from a from a moral principle as well. And then other other guides on things like activism for research is so how can you get involved in promoting ethical practice and research, covering things like unionization and whistleblowing and how to do so effectively. And also thinking about a bit of self-reflection. So your own positions within your research teams or your project teams, 
do you have power? Do you have privilege already? And how does that impact the way you approach your work, the way your team approaches their work, the potential conclusions they're coming to? And a really important part of all of this is to think about, um, yeah, self-reflect and think about what you're bringing yourself to these projects and how that can influence the, the impact that they have. And so as you can see, there's a lot going on within the Turing Way um, book and within the community as well. And I won't go through the whole time I'm with you, but um, it didn't all look at this from the beginning. So in 2018, it was the first commit uh, by Kirsty to go in the Turing Institute and has snowballed since then. And the main one to think about is in 2022, we've got over 250 live chapters, over 340 contributors, over 3,000 Twitter followers, and over 3,000 monthly visitors and six guides. And these visitors range from just people interested in this stuff, people working on research projects themselves to um, we've been referenced in sort of reports and released by different government departments. I think we've been referenced by NASA and some of the reporting and the work they've been doing. So we're starting to see some really cool, like global impact from the work that the community is doing, which is really cool. And also uh, a really important thing there, which we'll get onto as well, is translation and localization leads. So we're focusing on making sure the book isn't just accessible in just English, but accessible in different languages and different places around the world as well. So one thing, oh, one thing, one big thing that we've um, sort of learned over the last four years of, of, of having the community, um, is that there's some really important things to consider um, when you're practicing collaborative open source um, projects or principles. And we kind of split them um, into thinking about tools, what we call tools, practices, and systems. Um, so firstly, what are the sort of on the ground tools that you're using to engage your community and facilitate collaboration between people, but also more widely than the tools. And really importantly, what are the shared practices that you're um, practicing as a community to make sure you're all moving towards the same common goals, have the same mission, but also have a shared understanding of what the community is trying to do and the best ways to do that, all that kind of stuff. And then on a sort of really fundamental underlying level, what kind of systems are you putting in place to allow people to collaborate as easily as possible? So what kind of infrastructure do you have in place that then allows these practices to take place effectively and be communicated well and allow the tools to um, flourish and, and be easy to use as possible? So sort of going through these one by one um, on the tools level, so on the, sort of on the ground level, kind of some of the things that we're using is the Turing way. We use GitHub for our open knowledge management. So all of the content for the book is hosted on GitHub. And any updates or maintenance or new additions, all that kind of stuff is done through um, a public repository that anyone can contribute to. In terms of community engagement, we have a lot of community events and we um, We'll get onto exactly what those are at the end of the talk, but we also use Slack. We have a Slack workspace um, as a really sort of open and accessible way for anyone to join the workspace, join different conversations that they have interested in and get contributing right away. We also really focus on publication and citation. We use DOI for that. So making sure that any work that anyone is doing is being recognized um, and cited and easily findable so that if further institutions or organizations or people want to use these resources they can trace them back to, to where they came from and who authored them in the first place and kind of linked into that is acknowledgement so we have some bots um, on github um, to acknowledge anyone who makes any kind of contribution whether it's creating content but also fixing bugs or uh, maintaining content that's already there um, and more and making sure that any sort of work that anyone is doing is being recognized and acknowledged for and appreciated on the practices side, so again, thinking about these sort of shared understandings we have as a community to make sure we're all moving forwards together um, in the direction we want to go. Thinking about things like community support. So if someone has a question or an idea or a problem or literally anything they want um, support from the community from, or if say you're a new member and you don't quite know where to start, are you empowered to and do you know how to ask questions and get that support um, and get feedback from the community to, to help drive you forward and empower you to contribute to the, to the project? Um, but also thinking about things like review and verification, so making sure that any new content that's created or any updates that are made are in line with what the community is trying to achieve, and everyone agrees that this is moving it forward um, in line with the principles that we that we all um, follow. And thinking about things like maintenance as well, we're making sure that the resources staying up to date, the, the latest developments in the data science and research space, um, and is changing as required based on new discoveries and, and not becoming stale. And also, like I mentioned, this idea of localization. So making it's really important to make sure that we're not just written in English by people in London so that it is accessible to other English people in London, uh, but also making sure that we're translating things to other languages, but also updating the way these resources are communicated or different contexts people find themselves in so that they can be useful and applied anywhere 
um, by anyone. And yeah, on the sort of wider system level, um, so again, for our actual like open research infrastructure, so the underlying infrastructure behind how we put together the content for the guides, and um, we really rely on GitHub and it's, it's really useful for that open communication between the community. Also in terms of community infrastructure, thinking about things like what, what methods you're using and what sort of empowerment you're giving to members of the community to make sure that anyone can get involved and in the way that they want to as well. So the amount of time they have or the ability they have to get involved or what they want to do, they feel empowered to do so um, in a way that works for them and how can you set up the infrastructure to allow that to happen as easily as possible. And then on the sort of the, the wider side of the network infrastructure. So people who are working on similar things elsewhere around the world um, or similar groups trying to tackle similar problems, how have you set up the communication methods and channels um, and ways of um, working together with them so that, yeah, we're not duplicating work. We're not trying to like compete with each other, but we're actually cooperating and um, collaborating on creating these kind of resources. And yeah, just to re-highlight, re as you might have mentioned, I mentioned at the beginning and, and just to highlight again now, both in terms of the tools we're using, but also on this more fundamental infrastructure level, GitHub is really important um, for us and really facilitates this open knowledge sharing and filtering way. And some of the practices that GitHub allows us to do um, effectively for collaboration, which we think apply across the Turing way, but also really important to think about in your own project as well, um, is thinking about developing and sharing content and contributions. Um, so how can people not only write content, but get feedback on it and talk to different people in order to make sure and, and get ideas and thoughts from them to make sure the resources are as useful um, and comprehensive as possible. Maintenance and improving, um, again, really easy on GitHub and really important for these kind of resources. So it wouldn't be great if like everyone just created a ton of resources and they were just like, like splurged out all, all over the place and, and never checked and improved and maintained um, and kept up to date with, again, wider developments um, in, the, in the tech and science space. Um, sharing resources, so again, are they discoverable? Are they findable? Are they easy to share? If there are interesting things that could impact the way people engage with the Turing Way community, are those resources being shared as well? Reviewing and updating, so when changes are made, again, are they in line with what the community is trying to achieve? And yeah, really focusing on this idea of making it global and sharing best practices, not only within one specific context, but across the world, wherever they may be useful or helpful. So that's pretty much the introduction to the Turing Way. And the, the sort of main thing to say now is thank you so much to our community of contributors and users. Without the hundreds of people contributing and sharing their advice and thoughts and expertise, then the Turing Way would be nowhere near where it is today. And we hope to have you guys involved as well, if you want to be. And so sort of on that, you may be thinking now, oh, I'd love to get involved with the Turing Way, but I don't quite know how to and how I could do that. Well, we have a thought for you on that, which is how to use the Turing Way. It's a pretty important one because there is pretty much only one way to use it, which is however works for you. The most important thing says we, we are, we consider ourselves a decentralized community without a, a clear sort of, um, hierarchy or authority saying we must work in this way doing this and achieving these things and producing these this kind of content is very much a what does the community need what do you guys need how can you get what you want out of it and how can you contribute in the way you want to it's incredibly open so any way that you think the cheering way community can can work for you we'd love to talk to you about and, and bring you into the community and work with you to achieve that in terms of sort of specific ways to get involved so we have a ton of different community events um, collaboration cafes and co-working calls um, are great chances for you to bring um, ideas and thoughts, not only on the Turing Way, but any anything you're working on where you want the Turing Way community's feedback and thoughts on it, um, to sort of co-work and share those ideas with other people in the community. We also run sort of fireside chats and panel discussions and presentations um, about different topics of interest in the open science space. Twice a year, we run a thing called a book dash, which you can kind of think of as a hackathon, but for the Turing Way guides. Um, so again, it's writing content, also updating it, maintaining it. And they happen, I think, in it's one week in May and one week in November each year. Um, and a bunch of different community share outs as well for sharing, again, Turing Way related stuff, but also there's non-Turing Way related stuff you're, you're proud of, you want to share the Turing Way community. That is also extremely welcome and um, encouraged. We also, as I mentioned, have a Slack workspace. Um, so on this on this bit.ly link, there's all these resources. You can find them as well. We have a Slack workspace, which you're more than welcome to come join. And we have loads of different channels and discussions going on um, live there. We also, on our repository on GitHub, have a, hundreds of open issues and open PRs, which shows how live and thriving the book is. So if you want to get directly involved, you can go straight to the issues and straight to the PRs um, and start 
merging changes directly into Lifebook, which is awesome. And as I mentioned, all those community events and more. So if you stay up to date with us, you can you can see all the different kind of stuff we're doing and get involved whenever works for you. Just a few acknowledgements um, for Kirsty Whisker and Rodrigo Sharan and from the and the Turing Way community, friends and collaborators for all the work they're putting into the Turing Way um, community and content and guides. And as I mentioned, loads of links here. Um, I think we can circulate these slides as well afterwards. And anywhere you want to get involved, please do. We'd love to have you.